This is the first of two videos looking at camera-like projection in WebGL. In this first video, we're going to look at the simplest way of getting this realistic 3D view into your WebGL programs, and hopefully in a few minutes you should be able to do this completely off the top of your head, if you can memorize just three things. The second video is going to focus just on what's going on in perspective and orthographic projection. The point here will be to help you visualize your geometry as it goes through the rendering process, and especially when things go wrong, when you encounter clipping and z-fighting. So that's coming up in the next video. So what are you going to have to memorize? Just these three things. First, MVP, Model view projection in that exact order. Think most valuable player or minimal viable product or whatever, but commit them to memory. These are matrix names that, by convention, define the 3D transformations that allow us to see perspective projection in our 3D programs. Second, matrix multiplication, by convention, goes right to left. So, when we're writing our vertex shaders, GL position is usually calculated by multiplying our position attribute with MVP. So first the position vertex, multiplied by the model, then by the view, and last by the projection, right to left. And third, you'll have to know what functions to use to generate your view and projection matrices. The underlying algebra involved here is fairly simple, but dense. So it's pretty common to use a third-party library for help. There are a lot to choose from, and I recommend that you pick a library whose syntax you actually like. So which functions you'll be using will depend on which matrix library you choose to go with. For this video, we'll be using GLmatrix, and its function names are pretty typical for WebGL libraries. For our view matrix, we'll be calling a function called lookAt, and for the projection matrix, our function will either be perspective or ortho, depending on which kind of 3D presentation we want. So that's what we have to memorize. MVP, right to left, and at least two functions, which today will be look at and either perspective or ortho. Not a lot to keep in your head, right? Well, let's try it out. Here's our starting point. This program draws a multicolored cube whose vertex positions and colors are here. We can't really see our cube yet because the blue face obscures everything behind it. I have depth test enabled, and I'm importing the parts of the GeoMatrix library that we'll be using. I'm loading this as a module here, but you can load this however you want. Other than these things, our program is not a lot more complicated than anything else we've done in this series. We'll start with our vertex shader. We'll be sending in three 4x4 matrices. Let's bring them in as uniforms. They're mat 4s model, view, and projection. And in main, we need to multiply them with our vertex position position times model, then times view, then times projection, MVP, right to left. And that's all we really need to do. Time for the JavaScript. The shader is expecting three uniforms, so we'll need to look up their location. And WebGL offers us a custom function just for uploading mat 4s to uniforms. That's uniform matrix 4 FV. 4 because it's a mat 4, F because they're floats, and V because this will be passed in as an array, which OpenGL calls a vector. The function takes three arguments, first the location, then whether to transpose the matrix. Note that in WebGL2, transpose can be true, but it's pretty rare that it ever will be. And last, the matrix. These matrices don't exist yet, so we'll have to create them. We'll be using GeoMatrix here, so the way that you create a matrix is with mat for create. This creates an identity matrix. If you like to think of matrices mathematically, then an identity matrix is sort of the equivalent of the number 1, where if you multiply any number by 1, you get the same number back. Same with an identity matrix. And if you like to think of matrices as 3D transformations, then an identity matrix means don't change anything. This is a good starting point, because if we don't change these matrices, we should see no change at all in our canvas when we save. 
So let's save, and nothing changed. Great. That means that our shaders are working, and so are our matrices. All that's left to do now is to populate our matrices with actual values and give them some meaning. To start off, and just to prove things are working, let's modify our model matrix. I won't go into the syntax here, but let's add a rotation. Nice. And shrink everything? Great. So we can see our model matrix is definitely working. Now the view. And for that we use look at. Its job is to describe where our imaginary camera is located, what it's pointing at, and how the camera is oriented, upright or on its side or upside down or on some arbitrary angle. The syntax here is simple. The first argument is the matrix to be populated, so that will always be our view matrix. Then I, which is the physical location of the camera. Then center, which is the point in space the camera is looking at. And last, up, which is the rough direction you consider upward. In other words, the direction that points to the top edge of your viewport. So for I, let's move back along the z-axis, since it's basically our current view now. Center will be the origin, so the center of our cube, and up will be in the positive y direction. And save, and we're definitely looking at the other side of the cube. The angle flipped, and we're seeing the red side. So uh, let's try looking at this from up and to the side. <laughs> and now it's gone. Maybe we went too far? Let's try moving the camera in a bit. Okay, that's, uh, that's not a cube, but we're getting closer. But let's leave things here and move on to the last step, and that's to populate the projection matrix. It's the real workhorse here, and the hardest to describe precisely. At the end of this video, maybe you'll start to get a partial sense of what it does, but by the end of the next video, I hope that things will be completely obvious. So we can use either perspective or ortho here. Let's try perspective first. You can think of its arguments as if they were describing the internal properties of our imaginary camera. So its lens, its film dimensions, and its depth of field. Sort of. For GL matrix, the first argument, again, is the matrix to be modified, so our projection matrix. Then the vertical field of view, which is set as an angle. If you imagine things in terms of a lens, then this kind of describes the power of the lens. If you use a narrow angle, it's like using a telephoto lens for photographing things that are very far away. If you use a wide angle, it's like using, well, a, a wide angle lens. The second argument is the aspect ratio of the final image, which will be wide or tall or square. And the last two are the near and far planes, and they are super important. So let's just take a second here to introduce this idea. Near and far define a range. Any triangles inside this range will be drawn. Any that are entirely outside this range, because they're too close or too far away, will not be drawn. They'll be culled. And for any that cross these planes, where, where half is in and half is out, the portion inside the range will be drawn, and the portion outside won't. It'll get clipped. So near and far describe the range where our geometries will be visible. So let's try this out. Our matrix is the projection matrix. Let's use a wide angle. This is measured in radians, so let's go with pi over 1.5, or 120 degrees. The aspect ratio can be derived from the canvas size, which we should always get from WebGL itself. So GL canvas width over GL canvas height. And near and far, let's try 1 and 10. That's, uh, that's not a cube. So let's pull back our near plane a bit. Well, we see our cube now, but now we're looking inside it somehow. Well, we have two options, I guess. We can move the camera back a bit, that works. Or we can move the near plane back some more. That also works. Now, what happens if we move the camera back a lot? Well, now we're, we're so far back that it's too small to see, maybe? So let's, let's zoom in a bit. No, nope, still nothing. So, of course, it's because our far plane is not far enough out. Our cube is getting cold. So 
Let's try, oh, I don't know, 173. <laughs> yeah, great. We've got something on our canvas, but part of our cube is still getting clipped. Let's move our far plane back some more. And yeah, it looks fine. Last, let's put everything in a draw function and send the model matrix to its shader uniform. Update our model matrix to add a rotation. By doing this, we're applying an extra tiny rotation to the model matrix every time that we enter a new animation frame. So we should see this spinning. And it's animating. So now that it's animating, let's just play with our near and far planes again so that we can see that strange effect. So now, maybe you can visualize in your head a bit what's happening here. The front portion of the cube closest to us is getting clipped because it's in front of the near plane, and the back portion is getting clipped as well because it's behind the far plane. If this doesn't make obvious visual sense to you yet, don't worry. The next video is aimed at helping you get a much better visual intuition for what's going on here. Okay, now, instead of perspective projection, let's take a look at orthographic projection. It's responsible for this uncanny, super parallel view of our 3D objects. For GL matrix, the orthographic function is called ortho, and its arguments are super simple. First, the matrix to be modified, so the projection matrix again, and then the remaining six arguments are for the six faces of our view, left and right, bottom and top, and near and far. Let's try this out. Let's use negative 1 and 1 for all of our face values. Okay, that, uh, that looks good, except we can see some clipping going on on our corners. In this exact case, this is because our far plane is too close in. See how the problem gets worse when I move the plane further in? So let's move it out instead. Yeah, that fixed it. Now, if we move our top, bottom, and side planes out a bit, the object seems to shrink. Note that these values don't have to be symmetrical. The left, bottom, and near arguments don't have to be negative, and the right, top, and far values don't have to be positive either. It all depends on what you want showing up in your viewport. And that's it. I hope this seems as easy to you as it does to me. For me, adding a realistic 3D view to my WebGL programs is like filling out a form now. It all comes down to remembering those three things, that your, your matrices are MVP, model, view, and projection, in that order, that matrix multiplication is from right to left, and that the functions that you use to create your view and projection matrices, for GL matrix anyway, are look at and either perspective and ortho. So I'm serious, give this a try right away. See if you can do this off the top of your head. And be sure to watch the next video where I look at exactly what the projection matrix actually does. I hope to give you a really strong sense of what's going on in this part of your program and a way to figure out what's going on when things go horribly wrong in your renders.